right? Varieties of ways we can talk about leadership. And you can start with what <coughs> Maxwell is writing, you know, which all the Wall Streeters are buying. That's one way to understand about leadership. There's something I talked about last year, which was more on what is leadership from a Sikh perspective. Today's topic is within the leadership, there's huge conversation going on from the top five consulting firms on governance. And also in the, uh, I don't know if you guys realize, 2014 was one of the years where major governments were changing worldwide. So there's a conversation on political leadership going on, and there's a conversation on governance of the corporate leadership going on. So that's the case study today. That we will, I will venture a little bit in a more interpretive way. What do we know from the politics of the gurus? What do we know from the governance ideas of the gurus? And some of these terminologies were not there at that time. So we are using those terminologies now, but we look at the modeling. We look at what we generally say, what kind of metric did they use? What were their criteria on what constituted success? Just to start with, this morning when I read the Hukum from Darbar Sahib, something very interesting came in there, which made me, instead of spending 10 minutes on it, an hour on it. So this morning's Hukum had a title and a subtitle in the Gujri Ki Var Mahal Latija, which is Guru Amar Das Sahib. But then right after that it said, it had two names, because Guru Granth Sahib's Vars have some tunis, which are the folk tunes. And the names written there were Sikandar and Ibrahim. And I'm like, hmm, I wonder what this Sikandar and Ibrahim Tuni is, because this is not a Bani which generally I read. I'm sure I saw it before, but it never clicked to me. What is, and these tunes are based on some legends of Punjab. So I said, let me try to you know, Google it, and sure enough, not much comes out when you Google things of specific nature. Anything controversial, you're gonna get hundreds of hits. But if you're trying to figure out some legendary stuff, well, what I discovered is it was about leadership. That here are two guys who fought. One guy's name is Sikandar, and the other guy is Ibrahim. And the guru is celebrating which leader is victorious over the other leader. So there are legendary tales about it. But essentially, it became about, you know, sometimes we say leadership, well, at least in the common sense of leadership, not necessarily political leadership, people don't take stands. And generally, we'll hear this in the Sikh community as well. Let's stay in the middle of the road. Let's not take stands. Even in selecting how to sing that war, Guru was saying, we're going to sing it the way Sikandar won over Ibrahim. So these were there's something to think about. And the person who is assigning these, because we're going to present from a Sikh perspective, Guru Granth Sahib has very, uh, we will call them categorical descriptions of who the leader is. It's not in a generic sense how we have presented it today. Yes, everyone is a leader, but there are people who become representatives, representatives in different words. So Guru Arjan Sahib very clearly says, Takht Raja so hai, jo takhte laik hoi. Back then, the political leaders were heads of state who were monarchial. So Takht is a throne. Who gets to sit on the throne? He says, they better be qualified. That's the first line of the show. So there's a huge stress on qualification, which means we would today say, what's the criteria? What's the job description? Who is qualified to sit in that role? Who are the representatives, even of the intellectual, to borrow the phrase from Edward Said? So who represents us in academia? Who represents us in Gurdwaras? Who represents us in Toronto? There's a whole conversation this week in Toronto, or actually in a month now, you know, the world thought Canada is pretty good about gender equality and rights. And you've seen from parliament to talk show hosts who are popular even in America, what has been going on in domestic violence issues as well. So there is a popular aspect of an idea, and there is a policy aspect of an idea. Today, I'm gonna go more into the policy ideas when it comes to political levels and the governance levels. And I'll touch a little bit on non-profit because non-profit governance in the Sikh world is pretty loose as well. So I want to mention a few things about that as well because you know some of us are now parts of these uh, systems. So basically what I'm saying is, which I don't know how many of us look at Guru Granth Sahib from that angle, but Guru Granth Sahib is basically a manifesto. If you ask me, I would say it's a political manifesto. 
And here is why I say, which spiritual leader do you know in the world who was targeted by the state for assassination? Guru Arjan is the one who presented the Guru Granth Sahib to the world. To the world, not just to the six. And when he did it, the general at the time, as described by Guru Arjan Sahib in Guru Granth Sahib, Sulhi Khan was deputed to assassinate him. And here my reason, as I have understood it, the reason was because he questioned the qualifications of every representative. Religious, political, social, economic, academic, whatever these categories we have today. So this is what Guru Sahib does. It is deep introspection, you better believe it. So it is not for everyone. It is definitely not for people who are just looking to get, you know, uh, paradise in return. That's not what Guru Granth Sahib is. Uh, Guru Granth Sahib really focuses on what today I'm going to create the ideas on governance and politics as a subset. So let's get into that. Here's a phrase which I have which I'm sharing from Professor Puran Singh. Now, you can read it up there, as I, this is actually, he's written this in a foreword of his book, where he's basically saying, what is the politics of the Guru? And this is something we have to understand, because not very many people are talking about politics of the Guru. Mostly, we talk about spirituality of the Guru. Which spiritual leaders, yes, there are a few here and there, but can you imagine today, Dalai Lama being a political assassin, uh, being assassinated? Which means gurus were not just political and spiritual leaders. They were not spiritual leaders. They were actually going after the policies of what we would today call corporations or the state. Because they go hand in hand. And they always have the blessings of the religious leaders. So this is what Guru talks about. Professor Puran Singh says, the politics of the guru was no subjugation. Sounds familiar. I don't know if you guys have seen the chart which was produced a month ago about slave trafficking in the world. Even England, which was one of the first Western democracies to outlaw slavery 200 years before America, even they said they have about 30,000 slaves in, Canada, in, in UK. This is today. And this is what, and the slavery, uh, there's a political slavery, there is obviously human trafficking is going on, that's part of slavery as well. This kind of trafficking was happening in the 18th century when six used to go out and literally fight with the ones who were trafficking, human trafficking, taking the women of South Asia to the Middle East. So politics of the Guru was no subjugation of man to man, no wrong taxation. Sounds familiar? I mean, look at the loopholes in American tax law. Right? This is why, and I understand there are few attorneys here, but this is why we have so many attorneys as well, and so many accountants. There is wrong taxation. Religious people do that. You hear about this in the Middle East, but you hear about it in this country as well. You hear about it everywhere. You know, there's a fight about, you know, we have, is it a flat tax, is it a regressive tax, is it a progressive tax, but at the end of the day, there is a question of taxation. I don't know how many people who, who feel that they're religious actually think about taxation policies. That's the politics of the Guru. And Guru Nanak describes this very, very clearly, even when he's writing in Asa Kivar, that the wrong taxation by the Mughal Empire at the time. He fights against it. He says in the line, those of you know, Go Brahman Ko Kar Lave. Kar is a tax. I've been to Sultanpur Lodi. Those of you have been there, across the river, there's a broken tower. That was a tax collection tower. By giving particular religious tax to practice your religion, that was the only way you were allowed to practice your religion. And similar taxation exists like even today in the world. They might not be in Western democracy, but you know, uh, the whole one percenter versus 99 percenter stuff. It has to do with taxation. And there are other things he's written. Uh, uh, social injustices and all tyranny. Social tyranny, it's not only what we see in the news. It also happens in the homes. It happens in the churches or gurdwaras or whatever you want to call it. Tyranny is very much there. In fact, I was reading a book, actually reading a book review on the flight today, where this new book is coming out. And the author is describing how literally the European policies of last 150 years have created the repressive states of today. So we got to go to the root problems of where, why are these repressive states there? Guru Nanak talks about repressive states at his times. And he does not mince his words. I mean, the words are, which spiritual leader will write, write this? He says, Rajeshi Mukaddam Kutte. He says, the heads of states are like dogs who are 
you know, sipping of the blood of people, you know, things like that. He's basically critiquing the text, the policies of the state, that how it is not for the average person anymore, how it has become for oligarchs, we might call them today. Same ideas Guru Nanak is writing. And this, this idea about social injustice, I think all of you are very familiar with it, but six are actually not becoming part of those movements. There are a few here and there, but if 85% of the population is not doing it, then we are not doing it. Right now, not even 15% are doing it, so we are on the opposite end. Social injustice is what we were, fighting social injustice is what we were known for. In fact, I will contest to you, today six are talking about doing PR campaigns for images. Nothing wrong with it. If you want to do it, fine. But you know how the world knew us? In the toughest time, world knew us. Who are these guys who are fighting this ISIL in India in 18th century? Then they asked, who are these crazies? Similar things were going on in 18th century in South Asia. Nobody used to stop that. They used to come. In fact, sometimes they're just killing each other. In, in many a cases, and Guru Nanak is describing in uh, 1400s, he's actually saying they're Muslims killing each other. One is Afghan, one is a Middle Easterner. That's the famous Shabbat we sing. So it has nothing to do with their religiosities or their backgrounds. It has to do with what they end up doing. The, the perversion of mind is evil for us. And Guru Nanak questions that perversion. So Professor Poon is saying, is saying, you want freedom in life, you have to work on these policies. Guru Granth Sahib talks about these policies. And I think some of us need to really get busy talking about these. It's not about what you drink, what you eat, what you look like, how many barnies you do. That's your own personal prerogative. I mean, I'm from America, so I'll quote Jefferson here. He says, you know, my neighbor worships one God or three God or no God. It makes absolutely no difference to me. That's us. That's what we were known for. That's what Guru Tegh Bahadur, he didn't look at who he's protecting or not protecting. Char Sahib Zadani nobody looked at what they look like, what they practice, what they eat. This is the stuff we talk about today. Guru's focus was this, what Professor Poonan Singh is writing. And he's essentially saying, if there is no freedom, literally, freedom of mind is essential. You cannot have physical freedoms without the freedom of mind. He says everything fails. Your art will fail, your human love also fails. And we've seen this. In the, the best of the relationship, if we don't allow freedoms, even in the relationships, there are problems, control problems we call them, and they end up in bad relationships. And apply this at a community level. So what I want to do this is now apply this at a corporate level for today's purposes and at a political level. So what is governance? I mean, you guys all know this. We can look up in dictionaries and Wikipedia and whatever, but essentially at minimum, it means we will say, you know, the common phrase among six is Deg, Teg, Fateh. Simply it means Deg is economic policies, Teg is political rights, Fateh is victory. Victory is when you have secured economic and political rights. Governance is about that. Today, six are more busy governing religiosity. We never used to do that. Governance is about how everyone in the constituency gets affected. Guru Nanak did not come into this world to cause solve Sikh problems. He came here to solve people's problems. And we were part of the people, South Asian population was part of it, Baghdad's population was part of it, Sri Lankan population was part of it. Governance is about solving economic and political problems. This is about creating this, you know, performance as we call it today, expectations, and then again, if you are in an organization, then you meet expectations there. How do you create better processes? How do you assure the metrics are going to be met? But at the end of the day, they all translate into economic and political policies. And six beautifully have created a phrase out of it, they take Fateh, but I don't know how many of us really realize that. It's not a dictum. This was a policy of Banda Singh Bahadur. That phrase is coming out of the seal he had. And that phrase is a short version of a Persian couplet. And the simplified version basically meant, make sure you stay focused on economic and political rights of all, not just for six. So let's talk about what's politics. Today, this words get used a little bit negatively, justifiably so. I was going to make a joke on Jagmeet, but he left. So we'll pass on that one. Um, <clears throat> but you know, politics is not mudslinging. That's how we look at it today. Politics is, again, about act of governance. 
you know, you've heard the phrase, politics is art of impossible, right? Whatever is not, what is po politics is, whatever was illegal, just to put it in a different way, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, people work to make that legal today. Just like two years ago in America, homosexuality was illegal in armed forces. It's not today. Politics made that possible. Just like 100 years ago, women's suffrage movement wasn't going on. It was illegal for women to vote. It was illegal for black men to vote. It was illegal for six to exist in 18th century. We fought that. We paid for it with our lives as well. So politics has, you know, sometimes people get this caught up into, well, this is illegal. Illegal is different than, I don't want to get into because lawyers are here, you guys can define those things for yourselves. But all I'm saying is, just because something is illegal, it should not make us, scared, you know, we should be scared of that. It just means that policy hasn't been worked upon yet. And I've given you a few examples, which we are all aware of now. You know, it was, everything is illegal until people work to change that policy. And that policy could be anything. Usually it's economic and political rights. They take for it. Just keep that in mind. So what is politics? It's basically influencing decisions, making things happen. Uh, one of my favorite series uh, uh, I saw two years ago on HBO, it came. It was called John Adams. He's one of the founders of Second uh, American Nation. Uh, I really recommend that. Those of you who are interested in nation building of any kind, it is not romantic work, it is tough work. It requires lots of conversations, very tough conversations, uh, humbling experiences over and over, and even then everything doesn't work. Like at the time, when Thomas Jefferson at the time, when he wrote Declaration of Independence, he included freedom of slaves, he included freedom of women, but Benjamin Franklin wasn't interested because he was a slave owner as well. So, but they delivered certain things, right? That was the best charter the world had seen at the time. Let's come to six very quickly. What Guru Arjun gave as a charter in Guru Granth Sahib, world wasn't ready for it. Because even today, world has not understood what was given in Guru Granth Sahib. This is open access. You know, Jagmeet was saying that he's borrowed my ideas. I don't have a copyright on ideas of Guru Granth Sahib. Guru Granth Sahib is open source. Guru Granth Sahib is an open book. It's not even just for the six. And when the people who are considered disenfranchised are included in there, that really shook up the power centers of South Asia. Every religious leader and every political leader was unhappy with Guru Arjun. So governance requires some tough acts. Governance is not just continuing whatever the status quo is. Guru Arjun changed the system. He said, here is a new constitution. This is how we play the game now. Everyone's invited. And we're going to fight for everyone's right. And guess what happened then? His own family was bought? Absolutely. It's two of his brothers co-opted with the state. They created an alternative Granth, which even today is being debated by some of the Sikh authors. Even after Guru Arjan said, this is what we follow, this is our manifesto. So Sikhs at large have a lot of work cut out for us. We really need to understand this manifesto. And I'm using that word in today's political vocabulary because that's exactly what it is. It's not just about Sikh gurus, it is about every community which South Asia had seen at the time. And by extrapolation, it really is about what are we here to offer to 7 million people in the world? Do, are we even thinking from that angle? That would be politics. So there are all sorts of models out there. Obviously, I'm not gonna go over each model here, but you guys are familiar with some of these. You probably have heard of these if you, by even uh, executive notes of the books, you probably have seen some of these buzzwords. But I want to share which ones are available to us from Guru Granth Sahib. So essentially what's on the screen right now, if you're familiar with Moor Bantar, that's what I've written, but in a little bit different way. The declaration that there is only one should tell us that we have zero tolerance for sexism and racism. So whether what's happening in New York City today, or what happened in Ferguson, or what happened with the two MPs who were just removed, or what happens is happening with the prisoners in India, whatever is happening with three-year-old being raped repeatedly in last year, I don't know how many of these reports have come out of India. 
This should really get us worked up. That's what Ekwankar means. Zero tolerance for certain attitudes of what, we, what I'm calling racism and sexism. Because if you see the other, you're already racist. You're already sexist. Ikkumankar has things of that nature built in. This is why when Guru Gobind is saying, you know, we love to talk about laws among six, here is one law which nobody disagrees with, but we have failed to implement. One of his law is, you will not associate with people who practice female infanticide. Look at the ratios from Toronto to Vancouver and all the way in Punjab. There are problems we have. That became a law for us. One of the five things Guru Gobind Singh told us not to do. We don't take that seriously because we don't want to do serious things. This is about governance. There are certain things are not going to be compromised on. So because we don't want to take that seriously, we start debating about, you know, whether you believe in particular body or not, or whether you eat meat or not. Because that's unending debate, which Guru Nanak, by the way, dealt with. And he basically said people who get in those debates are stupid. That's his statement. Mas maskar murak chakra. So we can be stupid, according to Guru Granth Sahib, or we can look at the foundational principles in Guru Granth Sahib, and one of them, just to you know, bring it out from the idea uh, which I was sharing earlier, is to start practicing certain doctrine. Ikkumankar really means there is no other. Uh, it doesn't matter what color, what race, you know, style of turban or no turban. <laughs> I mean, this is just asinine stuff we talk about today when we deal with people. My practice is my practice. Seven billion people, it is unnatural to expect they're all going to look the same, walk the same, talk the same, eat the same. Tell that to Eskimo to eat dal. He can't survive. So point is, governance is born out of your right. If Ikkumankar is where Gurnana declared things, we need to spend a lot of time understanding that. So we have our governing principles. I would say these are some of our government governing principles. So world can say we hate the six, or we can have some political, I'm picking another one, you know, enemies they might call us. Six don't have this word. We believe in the idea of their bad. So the policy would be anytime we're deciding something, we actually have no enemies. It will draft, so when you're drafting resolutions, drafting policies, you have to think like that. It's like when you're dealing with nation state ideas, if a Sikh is sitting, I'm waiting for a real politician who is going to work with actual policies which are affecting the world, and I'll list them soon, according to the Global Risk Report, where they will apply these ideas. Right now, most of us, those who are interested, we still keep going back to 1940s UN Charter. Or if you're in Canada, you might be looking at the Canadian Charter of Rights. Or in America, they're looking at Bill of Rights. But they all go back to Magna Carta at the end of the day. They still have very clear boundaries in some cases. This is the boundaryless stuff. I don't think world has been envisioned this yet. And Guru Nanak declared this, lived this, practiced this, and six out of the ten gurus paid for it by being in jail, by being tortured, by being as a, a political assassination attempts, and by dying as political martyrdoms. This is serious data. They all did it to make this possible. So let's start, look quickly at some of the governance ideas of the gurus. Again, I'm not going to go over each of these, but let's look at these institutions as essentially building things to empower what we call it. Langar is not what we have made it to be. You guys know enough about it. You have a great case study of Save a Food Bank. It's about hunger. The world economists last year wrote, this is the first time in the history of humankind. The only reason hunger, hunger exists is because of the greed and the political will of the nations. Otherwise, we have so much abundance. Even a conservative magazine is saying this. You know how Guru Nanak tackled this? We tell a 20 rupee story, it is wrong. It wasn't 20 rupees. If you do 4% inflation, those of you who understand the financial and economic numbers, from 1470s to now, it becomes 300,000 US dollars. That's the level of investment it takes to take on a serious legacy project. So don't say it was $20, it was 300,000 US dollars. Of course his dad was gonna be mad. 
where the hell did you spend these $300,000? But that's what it takes. It took his intellect, Tanuman Tan, I'm translating that in English. It took his intellect, it took Guru Nanak Sab's monetary wealth, the assets he had, and it took his hand, the body, because he served it physically. This is when Gurbani says that Tan Man Tan Sab Saap Gur Ko Hukum We are really not ready to implement the decisions or the hukums of the Guru because we are not ready to actually spend all three things. So just to give one example, Langar is not a meal which we share. It is how we present these days. No, it really was to take on the hunger. And hunger of those who don't have it, not the hunger of people like me who are getting fed by eating more fatty acids. So it's a serious project. Governance and political issues, right? And we can apply the Gurmukhi. People don't have access to knowledge. The religious and political leaders don't want you to learn. So they said, you know what? If you don't want to give us access, we're going to develop our own language. Not a language, I'm sorry, a script which accommodates all the languages of South Asia. What does it take in genius design to accommodate multiple languages in a script which because the state and the religious leaders were saying you don't have right to learn because you're not born to learn your job is to serve they're like no we're going to actually create a creative solution and solution was creating a new script it was access to knowledge access to learning we are facing that today too by the way in a different way sure most of the world now can have access to learning but you know what the access to knowledge and learning these days is Anyone can go learn from the best physicist at MIT about a best show for free now, it's open. But if you want to go to MIT, it's getting even tougher. So access, the knowledge might be changing, but access to knowledge transfer is changing now. So I don't want to get into that right now, but the point is, gurus were getting into arms. You know, who has a right to own guns? You guys know that there are more guns in Canada than in America. But you rarely have incident like Americans because we are crazy with guns. Well, they're called crazies only if they're white men. If they're brown or black men, then they are terrorists. But puns aside, uh, the, the problem is that in this country, at least they have learned how to deal with it. Go back to 14th century, 15th, 16th, 17th century. This is the country, just to put it in perspective, 17 people as invaders come and they capture India without resistance. In that reality, Guru said, you know what? People need to know how to protect their own rights. These guys don't know how to protect their rights. That's the history. This is this year, in a revisionist sense, the Prime Minister of India's spokesperson said, after 800 years, we finally have a Hindu nation. Now, that's a negative statement, but just to put it in perspective, you know why 800 years? Because these guys were not, nobody was protecting India, or the Indians, I should say, or South Asians to be more accurate. And this is what Sikhs did, because these institutions were accesses. Today, you have wells all over India, people are worshiping on those wells. This was about water access rights. Today, if you listen to the Supreme Court of India's lawyers like Colin Gonzalez, he'll tell you there are more than 16,000 cases pending in Indian Supreme Court because a Dalit woman, the so-called low caste woman, fetched a water from the wrong well. This is today's reality. Gurus, wherever they went, they created a well. Look what we have done to them. We worship them there. We stand on the bodies and say, if we do enough Japji Sahib, somehow you go to heaven. Utter nonsense. This was water access. You go to any CIA meeting now, they'll tell you the next world wars are about water access. That's why Canada and America are sitting nicely because you have, we have a lot of water. But the world doesn't have a lot of water. Gurus were about economic and political rights. Just keep thinking. Spirituality was their source. Ikkohankar was their source. That source was used to deliver, today we will call, for where 1.2 billion people live. Of course they got upset. They upset at everyone. They upset at the religious leaders, they upset at the political leaders, and they paid for it. They paid for it with their lives. And here is one way to look at it. On the left side are the gurus, on the right side are the heads of the state at the time. There's a very interesting interaction between all of them. 
So one thing I want to mention is every guru interacted with the head of the state. There is Nanak was the Guru Nanak, the Nanak Padsha. Padsha versus Badsha. Badsha means emperor. Padsha is a word which six even today use for Guru Granth Sahib. I don't know how many of us realize that. That means the true sovereign. The sovereign which is not just in the political world, but also the spiritual world. This is where Miri Piri comes into play. But point is, they all interacted. And interaction wasn't pleasant every time. I had a chance to go where Guru Nanak was, in, again to put it in today's world, it is in Pakistan, where he was in jail, and he did what we would today call hard labor in jail, like Siberia. Can you imagine any spiritual leader doing that today? So please don't call them just spiritualists. He is very spiritual, but he uses all his spirituality to fight with unfair policies of the state unfair policies which are creating social stigmas. Every guru did this and all I'm trying to say here is that without having a confrontation, in some cases it's physical, in other cases it's dialogue, in other cases why do people go to jail? Either they are criminal or they're political dissenters. Guess what? Gurus spent time in jail. So we, of course they weren't criminal, but you better believe they had incredible political dissent. Now, we just had martyrdom day of Guru Tegh Bahadur, so I'll bring it to that very quickly. In Europe at the time, it's the same time Voltaire is in the jail. He was in jail, and this is the period in Europe called enlightenment. That's the term they use. When he's in jail, he's, he's asked if he will defend other people. He says, in descent, I will think about defending you. He's writing this from the jail. At the same time, in South Asia, Guru Tegh Bahadur, this is something the world hadn't seen. The word human right is not uh, invented yet, the phrase. And Guru Tegh Bahadur, if I paraphrase what Voltaire wrote, Guru Tegh Bahadur is saying, even in dissent, I will die defending you. Look at the gap, the delta between the two statements. And one is philosophizing and saying maybe other one is not philosophizing and saying, no, oh, I'll die. I believe every... So this is why when Guru Nanak declares freedom, it is not philosophical for him. It's a policy. And every guru actually worked on that policy. Guru, guru Tegh Bahadur implemented that. Every guru implemented Guru Har Gobind implemented it when he took on the forces of Jahangir. He was also... I went to that Gurdwara too. I want... If those of you are Sikhs who go to India, sure, go to Darbasa, but I request you, go to other Gurdwaras. In Gawaliyar is a Gurdwara where Guru Har Gobind spent time in jail. We just had Diwali, so you know, a couple of months ago, and people, we call it Bandi Chhod Devas. It's a beautiful place. I loved going there as a child. You know, it was about two hours away from where I was born. And, you know, the story is very simple. Even when he was told, how about we'll let you go from jail, he said, that's not enough. I want every political prisoner released. Can you imagine? This level of campaign, which Amnesty or HRW, I remember in high school in Kansas, becoming part of Amnesty International and writing those prisoners of conscience letters, right? Guru Har Gobind is doing that. He does not come out until all 52 political dissenters were released from the jail. America is the largest incarceration in the world. And we are sitting still, we should be taking that on. That's the stuff we are talking about when Guru is saying, this is our policy. We have our own Punjabis and Sikhs in jails in India, and we haven't figured out how to deal with that. Anyone who even tries to do it, they get a label of terrorist, and we just become quiet. Yeah, just remember, Guru Har Gobind was enemy number one of the state, and he was jailed. So was Guru Nanak. Historical facts. They did hard labor in jail. So these guys are very different. I'm calling them guys to explain in today's parlance, but that's why the Guru in Sikhi then is more than any spiritual personality. They become leaders which the world hadn't seen. They are not even prophets. They are like perfections, as Guru Granth Sahib calls them. Perfections in policies, perfections in ideas, practice daily. And this is something to, again, we need to learn how to have this dialogue. And I'm basically saying every Guru was politically active. Every single Guru. It's 239 years of data we have. 
And today, I go to a lot of places to speak. I've been told this when I go to certain Gurdwara. Uh, don't speak politics here. I'm like, really? Where should I go? <laughs> because this is what Gurdwara was supposed to be. Gur you know the first Gurdwara in America? The first Gurdwara in Canada? Just because there's some Canadian, let me just talk about Canada. First Gurdwara in Canada held a meeting. When nobody allowed a place, the Gadar movement meeting took in a Gurdwara. Tejas Singh was the convener in Vancouver, and this is where they said, let's figure out how to have a rebellion. Our Gurdwaras are, our gurdwaras are not worship centers. Our Gurdwaras are where we teach knowledge access, Gurmukhi, where we teach trainings, where we teach, in today's world, we will say this is where we should be talking about hunger, and because they don't, we need Seva Food Bank. This is where we should be talking about immigration reforms. If they don't, so we have things like no one is a legal campaign outside Gurdwara. But this is what we were supposed to champion. We were supposed, we championed it. We even championed it 70 years ago. Immigration reform movement in, in the labor movement when it was at its height in America. There were a lot of farm laborers who were six in Canada and in America. The leader at the time in America was Cesar Chavez. And he used the phrase, Viva la Khalsa. Because six joined him. Today, 100,000 people show up on streets of Los Angeles two years ago. Not a single Sikh joins for immigration reform. That's the gap we have to work on. Even in the 50s, when we didn't have this many rights, Caesar Chavez says, Viva the Khalsa. He's like, these guys stand with me to protect labor rights. Something for us to really think about what are we doing in these countries. And my point here was that gurus were not passive. They were not bystanders. They were not observers. They were act there. They were in the game. They were playing. This is a Guru Nanak. Don't use that phrase just about martyrdoms when he says, Joko Prem Khelan Ka Chao Sir Kar Kali Gali Muriyao. It means you want to play the game of love? Get your hand dirty. Let's go. Let's get in the trenches. And trenches doesn't mean you know, World War I trench. Trench means if you're fighting a domestic abuse issue, you go all the way. I mean, the other day I tweeted something about Gloria Steinem. Some people got very upset with me. They're like, are you suggesting that, you know, sick women should burn their bra? I said, you know, you just, you haven't figured out. I'm like, you know, these women, when they were fighting for feminist movement, it wasn't, they were, they were called crazies in 60s. Which, you know, Norway today has 40% quota for women in boardrooms. That's by quota. But even there, CEOs there are 5%. In America, it's 4%. So I'm not talking about quotas. I'm talking about real policy changes. Our Gurdwaras don't see them. Our organizations don't see them. We need to, we have serious work to be good. Guru Amar Das did it. You know how Afghanistan is today? His emissary, his ambassador to Kabul was a woman. He's like, you want to deal with me? You got to deal with women. And the legacy of that is, three years ago, we still have a woman. Uh, uh, doctor uh, uh, Anar Kalikar Honrayar, 24 year old medical doctor, human rights activist, and uh, uh, woman of the person of the year of, uh, from Afghanistan. But we don't talk enough about her. She's doing this in tough spaces. If you think you have it bad here, you know how Afghanistan is. This is so we need to do some major changes even in Canada, but our people are still doing it. We need to highlight it. So what is guru and social responsibility quickly? Well, you can read it up there, but if I break it down, there is an issue of racism and sexism. It's very simple. The way you deal with what we, you know, groupism is this whole caste, clan, tribe business. We don't have one. And the way you have to deal with that is, Guru Nanak says that. He says very clearly, and we like to invoke that, but we are not invoking that in the policy making, when he says, Upadesh Chau Varna Sanja. So the Indian that are desired in the caste system that there are four varnas and things of that nature. He's like, you know, my message is same to all. What do we do? We have a message if we in front of this audience, different message for different audience, right? Depending on who's affecting our funding, I might even uh, play a role in there when I'm at my fundraisers. But I got to change something there. It is exact same message. Whether Guru Nanak is standing in front of Babar, or whether he is having a meal with Pai Lalo. Exact same message, same story. No two versions. 
we, we have different versions. We have one version at home, how I deal with my wife. We have one version for interfaith meeting. We have one version for Gurdwara meeting. And we have one other version for public speech making. Bullshit. That's what it is. It's utter bullshit. There has to be exact same method. How, what Guru Nanak says to his wife is exactly what he says to any Rani he saw in his travels to Sri Lanka or Assam. No two different messages. What he said to yogis was exactly same as what he said to his dad. Same messaging. We got to get on to that same page. And when we get into these different stories for different people, the way you tell a story might be different based on the cognitive and communication and other issues, but the message can be different. And this gender, I don't know what, you know, there's a lot of engendering going on. We have created more sophisticated ways of doing that now. We just don't say it, but we do it. All I can say about that is that organizations which are run by 1.5 and 2.0 generation, they need to seriously work on some gender equity and leadership as well as uh, in other places. I mean, people, how can you even imagine, imagine a Jathedar who's a woman? Guru uh, Amar Das did it. The commander of the Sikh battalion, Guru Gobind Singh, did it. My Pago, I went to her place. She lived, you know, about uh, 16, kilo, 14 kilometers from Azul Sahib. I couldn't pick her bun, gun. She was much more stronger than I am. So all these bullshit arguments we have about capacity and capability, they're utter nonsense. It really is about we don't have our head right. We actually haven't figured out the manifesto of Sikhi, which is a co-ankar. I don't want to see the color, the skin, the gender. Today we might even add things like, um, you know, uh, LGBTQ in there. We need to start doing that. It has absolutely, when he said, we need to include what Richard Dawkins is talking about in there. Guru Nanak doesn't say this is only about the theists. He said this is about everyone. This is about the new movie which is about to come out, you know, where the force will reawaken. That's what Guru Nanak is talking about. He refuses to use even the religious vocabulary of the time. He didn't say, Ikka Haga. This is how powerful Ikka Wankar is. We have done a lot of injustice to it. He included anyone and everyone, and he believes we are all divine, we all have the same capacities. So our policies and our politics is born out of that. This is why he's able to do what he's able to do, because he completely practices that. So here are three case studies quickly. Because people talk about what if Sikh becomes a ruler, look at how screwed up we are, this and that, blah, blah, blah. Well, this is what I know. This is the data. Who is not screwed up? Which government do you know is working properly? I mean, look at even in America, where things are. I mean, we have a black man for a president, and in the last month, you have seen what is going on. No country in the world has grand jury except America. America actually outlawed secret trial. The lawyer sitting here, that's like a secret trial. Nobody hears about what happened in it. There's some funny stuff going on everywhere in the world. It's not just about India. Everywhere there are issues. There are inequalities. There are discriminations. What Guru Granth Sahib says, as long as there is a second or third class status in the world, there will be instability. Whether it's at home, whether it's in Gurdwara, whether it's in politics, whether it's in the corporate house. And this is the Shabbat, Domna Sen, Begampura, the city without sorrow is possible. We're going to make that city without sorrow. Here is a case study. Banda Singh Bahadur led this Khalsa Raj. His economic and political policies, even the authors who don't like six, even they say this was one of the best administrations. The power was given to the tillers of the soil. Administrators were both Hindus and Muslims and Sikhs. Religious accommodation, not tolerance. Tolerance is so 1960s. We are the people of acceptance. Guru Nanak said, no, don't just tolerate. Toleration means law is requiring you to do it. Acceptance is, I actually accept you the way you are. And that's what Guru Nanak's idea of principle was. And when he did it, and the case in point is, the same fanatic Muslims not every Muslim is a bad Muslim. We got crazy ourselves. We don't say particular faith is bad. We all are crazies. You know, coming here, I don't know if you realize, I was reading some history of the Mormons. The church last three weeks ago admitted Joseph Smith had 40 wives. And we only, you know, people are just, you know, Fox News only goes after Muslims for Prophet Muhammad, right? We got to just calm down a bit. There is a lot of stuff we don't understand. There is a lot of stuff which is getting sanitized. 
Banda Singh Bahadur, when he dealt with people who were fanatic Sunnis of Naqshe Bandi order, he didn't go crazy. Where they worshipped, he didn't touch. He says, we'll deal with you in the battle. Because back then, the idea used to be demolish everything. Even US government, look what they did to certain places to worship in Iraq. Banda Singh Bahadur never touched them. That building is still intact. If you want to go check it out, it's near Sarhant. In Sarhant, sorry. So there is a particular governance model and political model six presented, and it worked, and they practiced it. Here's a corporate case study. This is very interesting. Seeing some of people look at it as one way or other way, here's another way to look at it. <clears throat> tomorrow is Pai Veer Singh's day. He was born tomorrow. And I find his life very interesting. He dealt with two hegemonic forces of the time, two religious hegemonic forces. Lot of Hinduization of Sikhs and the new Christianization of the Sikhs, as it's called. He studied Sanskrit, Farsi, and he also studied English. He went to a convent school. Look what happened in that time. You need your own economic freedom, so you need your own bank. In America, Muslims run their own loans now, which Freddie, uh, the, the Freddie Mac, which you know, the housing loans they call them, Islamic loans, they even are operating. What is Sikh economic theory? When are we going to figure that out? What does Tera Tera means at Modi Khana when Guru Nanak was doing it? What is this idea of ethical living and ethical earning and ethical spending? There is some work to be done. But point here was, yeah, we had our own bank set up. We created our own educational conferences and schools, newspapers, novels, and then come the legislation. If you have considered, you know, sometimes we don't have people, we say people are not behind, uh, you know, working with us on certain cutting edge policies. You, got, you need a lot of educational work before you ask them to join some political work. This is what these guys did at Singh Sabha. They spent 30 years educating, then bam, bam, bam. In 10 years, we are fighting on Kirpan in this country, and you know the last judgment wasn't the best judgment. It's the best yet, but still not the best we would like to see. Look what they did. Within first 14 years of uh, after 30 years of educational movement, they took care of business. <coughs> so I'm calling this corporate because what, what is corporate environment? Basically, these guys were uh, Singh Sabha people. There were two different ten different models or two different major Singh Sabhas. I don't want to get into Singh Sabha case study. My point here is they used the resources and they figured out how to deliver for community. To me, this is actually more political and we don't think of it as political. That's what politics is. What policies are you delivering? In fact, the Stanford study, which came out about six years ago called Forces for Good, it studied 10 best nonprofits of the world and it said, nonprofit should only exist for one reason now, to change a policy. Otherwise, it's a business. Think about that. What policy are you trying to change? If you're not trying to change any policy, then it's just something to feel good. Gurus were changing policies. Access to knowledge, political rights, economic rights, water rights, you name the rights, that's what, women's rights, all those things. Okay, let's talk about, I call it Missile America and Missile Canada and Punjabi, that's what we will say. Now, I don't have all the organizations there, don't get upset at me, look at my assumption. In last 15 years, and I'm calling on 1.5 generation plus who started these, not that I know WSO exists, so don't get upset at me. I know Centennial exists. But here what I'm saying is, I think there is something happening primarily in North America where we finally have stuff happening. It's not the best work, but stuff is happening. Now this speaks to that ground is ready. So don't demand everything will be perfect, but this is the first time we are actually seeing Ideas put into practice, good, bad, ugly, I don't think we have the luxury right now. But we have something going on. Maybe you know some acronyms, maybe you don't, but it's really good to, nowhere in the world this is happening. So maybe that speaks to something in US and Canada. I, what I'm basically saying is that this is what's going on for the last 15 years. It's time we now take all these organizations to task and demand what policy change are you working on? Because it's not enough to say, well, I do good music, or I do whatever. Now everyone wants to do education for the non-6-2. That's become like a bus thing. We want to know 
what policy are we working towards? Maybe we should create non-profits um, which will fold when you have changed that policy. Something to think about. Six used to do this. That's why I'm, and you know, they used to have six months to do it. So basically, you know how you, I don't know how Canada works in America, you can set up a non-profit, you can put a date when it starts, you can put a date, it will get dissolved. That option is given there when you set up. Six did this in a very different way. They were called Sarvat Khalsa. I put that up earlier. They would meet every six months, and they will say for next six months, what will six work on? Every six worked on it, and guess what it got done? Today, we don't know what we are working on most of the time. So I'm not saying all 30 million six will work on it, but at least at organizational level, we should really start to think about which policy changes. And we can start demanding that from our political leaders too. But here is where the world is. This, this was the last global risk report in 2012. Geopolitics is the number one issue in the world. Depression because of geopolitics. Where are six in the Middle East fighting this? I would say, here is, here is one thing I want to mention, and this is, just think about this for a second. There are 30 million six right now. If I take 1% of that, it becomes 300,000 six. I guarantee you, if 30, 300,000, let's say 30,000 six, 0.01%, if they were there taking care of ISIL or ISIS or whatever the hell they're calling themselves, we did this in South Asia, and everyone was asking, who are these guys? We actually don't take care of things anymore. We just want people to know who we are. What, why? What have you done? Something to think about. Yes, we do a few things. There are good acts of charity, but I'm talking as a collective. As a collective, these are the issues. Economic issues in the world. We are not setting up any, you know, a sick-based governance or political model of some loans or some other things. Microcredits from Bangladesh are coming to the world. Everyone has recognized. Maybe something to be looked at there. Societal issues, environmental, it's not going to do enough to show up at a parade on you know, economic summit, which by the way in New York City was sponsored by BP. We don't even do our homework. Of course everyone showed up there, it was a hoopla. The real one took place a day after only 2,000 people showed up. But when the corporate sponsorship happens, BP sponsoring climate summit, of course it's gonna be a big show, and it was a great show. We have to ask some tougher questions. For when Puran Singh we celebrate, he wasn't looking for particular garland, although Patwan Singh wrote that book. So when we're looking for garlands, maybe we will, not, we will not work on real issues. And technology, use, abuse, who's working on that? The guy's in, well, he's not invited to America anymore. That's the guy working on it. That's the cost. Julian Assange, are we, are we ready to support people like that? That's what I think we should be thinking about. We should be debating that. Gurus use the latest technology. Technologies mean whatever the newest thing available is, how do you create for the people? You know, who had access to language? We just talked about it. How people didn't even have paper in India. You know, if you go 70, 80 years ago, most people didn't have education. And Gurus are saying, you know what? We're going to create a system where people know their rights. And one of the first things to know your rights is access to knowledge. I don't think we're creating access to knowledge to Guru Granth Sahib. We have literacy accesses now. Access to Guru Granth Sahib is too powerful. So we don't create that. We just keep, you know, people like me keep spinning or others, and others believe. But that's not the way to do it. We need to really create access to Guru Granth Sahib. So what is the Sikh model, to end it briefly? Well, you probably have heard of this phrase, and it's today's word when we say Nam Japo, Varn Japo, Kirt Karo, which, by the way, is not a phrase from a Guru period. It's a phrase from 1920s. This is the Gurbani phrase. That phrase is fine too, but this is Gurbani. Naam is about deep introspection. You repeat things, do whatever you need to, take a walk, but introspection. Any work requires deep introspection. This is why political dissenters say, go spend some time in jail. <laughs> because you get to introspect. Nelson Mandela did it, <laughs> Gurus did it. There is something about jail and introspection. Again, political dissenters, not the criminal ones. There's a difference between the two. Okay. Da, the idea of philanthropy, we really need to figure out what that is. You know, other day, I think a couple of months ago, I think it's a Stephen Colbert who did a thing about philanthropy. 
that what philanthropy has become, it's philanthropy. <coughs> now the new technologists, the new billionaires are really thinking about it. They did a meeting a year ago in New York. They invited 100 billionaires and they were asking, they asked for two days, what should we do? And you know, I said, I got this summary report, it was very interesting read. And basically they were saying, somebody said, let's make video, let's do this, let's, do, let's create endowment. The three guys who were chairing it or hosted it, um, uh, they basically said, you know, they listened to every idea. They said, if these billionaires still have a need for recognition, something is wrong. You already are enough recognized. They're like, how about doing things where it's not about recognition, but solving some problem. And that's something we have to think about. In Gurbani, the idea of philanthropy is Pun daan ka kare sarif. Your existence needs to become of benevolence, not an act of charity. Think about that. That's the idea of philanthropy in Sikh. Ishnan is not physical. This is about uh, creating clarity. Ishnan in Gurbani comes for daily Ishnan of mind, mental clarity. I mean, you can have other shnans and I'm sure if you don't do enough of it, how many times can you use perfumes eventually will scan, right? So it's not physical, it's just now. Mental clarity is the model. So whether you're creating a policy for E and Y, or whether you are sitting for you know any law firm, state, Gurdwara, school, this is the thing. The idea is, is have, we, have we thought about it? Is there introspection? Is there clarity in purpose? And does it have a spirit of real philanthropy, not just for recognition? Okay, so practically what that means is, this is the kind of terms we are used to. You know, nonprofit world, it really needs to become about transparency. That's the only word I'll just use right now. Especially the sick nonprofits really have problems with this. If we are not transparent, then I don't know what we can be. There's so many nonprofits in America, I don't know about here, but when I go on Charity Navigator or GuideStar, I think there are two which have a transparency rating in America, even of the 1.5 second generation ones. We need to become transparent. If we are not transparent, something is wrong. Corporate world, I think, uh, I've, I've done a few talks as well in this in Europe, uh, in England mostly, but what I'm hearing in corporate culture, you know, there was a Harvard study out of the lawyers who are graduating, this was two years ago, graduating class, they asked them, will they lie if they have to, they said sure. They said, will you still do if it's criminal, they said sure. 87% said that. That's what's wrong. Nobody get, Chase is willing to pay billions of dollars in fine and change policy. You know that this happened six months ago. That's the problem. This is the old Pinto, uh, Ford Pinto problem. We don't want to fix the car because we have calculated it's, it's easier to just pay the damages. Integrity problem. There's a serious integrity problem. And the last one is government. Government is all about, we just call it, well, the, the government models are being questioned worldwide. I don't know what the new models are. I was recently in Singapore, other than political freedom, everyone loves it there. You've seen the other indices being produced that how people in Bhutan are the most happy people, the happiness index they call it now. So I think uh, recently there was a, a TEDx presentation I saw where it's not all about GDP, somebody just came up with that and that's how we measure everything. So Gurbani would say something about measuring other indices as well. Welfare of the people and the happiness and things of that nature. And that's what governments need to go into. I'll end with this. But it's a long quote by Kapoor Singh, those of you know him, he loves run on sentences. I guess that's how the Cambridge people used to write 60 years ago. But uh, what he's essentially saying here is that the word God gets invoked way too much. And you know this, you know, what's the religion in America these days? On Sundays, everyone will tell you it's NFL. So both sides are praying to defeat the other. That should tell you what's wrong with this. We do the same thing. We invoke God for all sorts of funny scenarios. Battles, wins, medical and school exam, whatever it might be, spouse to be, I don't know, people do this in funny ways. And something is wrong with that model. Because it just, we are all, you guys are smart people. One side is going to lose, so are they saying the other, other side's stuff God didn't listen to? So what Puran Singh essentially is saying is, actually if you feel everyone is divine on this earth, then you will not evoke us versus them idea. That's sorry, Kapoor Singh is saying that. 
So this goes back to Eko Ankar principle. Be very, very, very cognizant to create boundaries based on anything, including geography, including what we call now nationalities in the Western models of democracies. Because they're all map making based on you know, whoever liked it at the time, whatever they liked. So essentially, even the word secularism doesn't capture what is going on, because there's a pseudo-secularism going on in lots. The French discovered that there were riots there four years ago. They haven't figured out what multicultural plan is either. Idea of governance in Sikhi is very simple. I'm going to bring it back to Ikko Ankar. Ikko Ankar is a basic premise of all governance policies, all politics of the guru. And what gurus did with that, they did not shy away from taking stands, is what I want to get into. Whether it was Modi Khanna, we have a Modi as a president in India now, a prime minister. And, you know, other day I joked with that and said there's a Modi Khuni because the guy literally has blood of so many people and he is a prime minister of India. But the Guru Nanak operated in Modi Khanna, that story we don't tell properly. What is this Tera principle? What is this yours principle? We need to work hard on it. The world calls that number unlucky. And this is why the mystic way of doing things. Whatever the world says, we say we'll do it opposite. If the world is unlucky, we'll turn into lucky things. So economic or food grain politics, U.S. just signed a food grain agreement with India. India has surplus food in its godams, but people are dying of hunger. It might surprise you, the statistics which came out two months ago, most of the hunger is not in Africa. Number one hungry nation in the world is India. And they have surplus food. It's again the political will and the politics. And U.S. just agreed that they will bypass that, they won't sanction them. So there's some serious issues happening all over the world. Six used to be part of from Punjab, the breadbasket of India. How come we are only producing and we are not also questioning how it gets bought, how it gets distributed? Why should we be reduced to just the blue labor or, or the laborers or the tillers only? We didn't do that in Bangla Singh Bhadar. We revolted. We said, hell with this, your policy is not right. You're not selling it at the right prices. You're not giving it to people who need. And you know, so those kind of, America has the biggest subsidy in the world on food and nobody says anything. People think it's great. But in other places in the world, it's not happening. And six are party to these things. So whether it's the intellectuals representative, I didn't touch that today, and I didn't touch much on the nonprofit, but the, the, the politicians, they need to start looking at, it doesn't matter which party you want to belong to if you're in Canada, I know NDPs and liberals and conservatives uh, is what we generally go after here. In, America. in India, it's the same thing for job. Eventually, they're all the same because you know, they all become party. In Canada, it's the same thing too. Eventually, it's all party. We should really be asking and have a conversation on policies. Support whoever supports the best policy. We used to do this. When nobody did that, then we became the policy makers. I think it's time to go back into their roles. Don't just do the hard labor. We need to start doing the smart labor, which essentially means Educational policy key home. Who has rights to education in which school districts? Political policies, immigration policies, uh, subsidies, whatever all these things are, this is where we need to be, including the military policy. We were very known for that. Now we are just used as soldiers. We don't have any say in anything. And we need to start having those conversations. If we are going to fight for our people's right to join armies, we better start having conversations on what these armies do as well. Because we had this conversation. Guru Hargobind's first battle was on this conversation. Where do people's rights begin and where do interior rights end? That was the conversation, first battle. Hopefully this gave you a few things to think about. Uh, uh, and question our current existence as a community. And hopefully some of you will become whatever your politics, right or left, you know, it doesn't matter because your right is my left right now. It just depends on the positioning. So let's figure out how to position ourselves to deliver more for the community. Thank you. We have about five, ten minutes for Q&A if you want to. Go. Oh, go ahead, you just moderate. Sorry.